welcome to our Researchers in Conversation podcast, in which I talk to a range of guests about their research journey and the value of research. I'm Hannah Hickman, a Senior Research Fellow at UWE and a freelance planning consultant specialising in research. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Elena Marco as my third guest. Elena is an architect and educator who energetically leads the largest department of architecture and the built environment in the UK. It is truly multidisciplinary with Elena's department including lecturers across 20 different built environment professions. She originally studied architecture in both Spain and the UK, building on an enviable reputation at Field and Clegg Bradley Studios before joining the group in 2005. Most recently, she has somehow managed to fit in to her incredibly busy agenda completion of her PhD, which we will come on to talk about. Elena, there is so much more I could say in this introduction, but welcome to this podcast. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor, actually, to have a conversation with you, Hannah. Thanks, Elena. Well, I wanted to start by asking you where your passion for architecture Came, came from? Was that from, a, from an early age, from your environment, or is that something that has evolved over time? So my dad was a builder, uh-huh. and I used to spend my Saturdays going uh, on site. So before kind of breakfast, I would go at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we would go and do the runs around site. And that meant that I got uh, interested in it, maybe because I didn't want to do the dodgy things that he might be doing in some case. <laughs> So when I had to choose my career choices, it was between architecture and engineering. And I decided to go for architecture, and uh, I enjoyed it, yeah. That's super and, interesting um, to think that you might have gone down an engineering path. My sister ended up going to the engineering path, but I ended up going to the uh, architecture one. And uh, I don't know if it was because my dad was kind of thinking, oh, I think you are kind of, you might be an engineer, and then you just have to kind of go against your dad and say, no, no, I'm going to so that's fascinating, is it, or whether that, that shows that your, your brain already had that sort of very creative side. But if you were interested in engineering as well, then perhaps that produces the perfect architect and then you're able to bring those two, two disciplines together. Maybe, maybe it did. Um, you, you have to take into consideration that the architecture uh, career in Spain is very different to the UK because mm-hmm. we do building service engineering, we do structure, uh, structures, um, a construction, uh, so it's a very different type of uh, architecture to the one in the UK. Some of my my friends specialize on structural engineering or building services engineering, so it's a slightly different path, which was a surprise when I came to the UK 21 years ago, because I came to do an Erasmus exchange. Ah. My English was rubbish. Um, and they gave me the opportunity to go either to come to Bath to do an Erasmus exchange or to go to Copenhagen. Ooh. My heart was in Copenhagen, but my English needed Bath, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah, oh, that's really fascinating. I was going to ask you what predicated your move from the warm climes of Spain yeah. and the rugged Pyrenees to Bath and then Bristol. So it was Erasmus. Was that a good experience? It did. It was the most amazing experience, so I kind of came to Bath University to do the Erasmus Exchange. I met an array of people and networks that they are still with me and I still have got really good contact with all of them. And um, from all countries, Belgium, Italy, Greece, uh, Finland, and it's just a really nice to kind of still get in touch every year. And uh, I also realized how different architecture was taught in this country. So it was really interesting to see that you had a portfolio in Spain. We didn't know what portfolio was. And uh, the crit was never done as you do it. Uh, So it was a really uh, steep learning experience, but one I enjoyed. And my tutor at Bath University gave me Peter Clegg from Field and Mm -hmm. Studios, risked it and said, yeah, I'll give you a job. And he gave me a job and I decided to stay while I was finishing my final project, thesis project at here, while doing an elective in Barcelona. And those times there was no really email podcast or anything like that. So I had a friend of mine 
going to the lectures, getting the notes, sending them by post. Gosh. And I was studying here to finish my last elective and my thesis uh, projects while I was working in Field and Science Valley Studios. That is amazing. How do you look back on that time? So crazy or, or, or fond, fondly? You were saying that the teaching styles were different. So you were, you were finishing off your, your time at Bath, you were practicing, and you also were digesting notes from, from friends in, in Barcelona. Yeah, I was finishing my studies in Spain. So I finished. Um, for me, the key one was like I enjoyed that time. Um, if I would have stayed in Spain and practiced in Spain, I would have probably had to stay there for a couple of years, very badly pay. Mm -hmm. And the first time I saw my salary at, in Field and Craig Bradley, I thought, oh my God, I don't need my mom and dad. I can do it by myself. <laughs> and I remember phoning my mom and dad in Spain and saying, I'm staying. And my dad, kind of proper Spanish, said, you are not staying. You are coming back to, to, um, to Spain to finish your career. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to finish while I'm work. And, I'm going to be fine. And I found them in my door of my student accommodation 10 days later with the suitcases, uh, you know, asking me to come home. And I kind of remember showing them the pay slip and said, no, no, I'm, I'm going to be independent. I don't need you anymore. Oh, and gosh. in a way, I was ready to separate from them, but they were not ready to separate from me, which is interesting. Oh, gosh, what an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. Right. Thank you for sharing that with us. I mean, we, we have both transitioned from practice to academia, although, of course, in the field of architecture in particular, these are not exclusive domains at all. What, what drew you to the academic life after your time at Field and Clare Bradley? So, in building and Field and Clare Bradley, it was amazing because it allowed me to work in incredible projects and build a um, sustainability background and uh, expertise that I did not have, and there was none in Spain. And uh, also allowed me to work on the first international project, which was a housing, social housing scheme in in Madrid. And oh. I was able to kind of work, you know, in the UK. I was traveling to Madrid, and I was doing the first international project for them. And that was really amazing to be able to work with that. But I did hate contractors in a way like they did the same job as my dad. Like kind of they, every one of them tried to kind of water down all the things I was doing. Oh, of course. So I did have a bit of a rough patch, and I had to reassess what I was good at, and uh, and I re at the time also I was doing a couple of days at Bath University mm -hmm. as um, a visiting lecturer, and I realized I enjoy seeing the students getting through their journeys, and I was very good at helping them. Mm -hmm. So I spent 18 months back between 2004 and 2005 doing some consultancy work for Field and Red Bradley Studios. Get working at the University of Bath and then working in a small landscape uh, practice mm -hmm. doing gardens for tremendous rich people that could spend, you know, mm -hmm. half a million in trees. Fun. And so <laughs> <tall>. <laughs> no, that's, that's a different type of spending money. Yeah. Um, and then while I was thinking how to do the transition to higher education, and UE gave me an opportunity that I will never forget. And they say the rest is history. Absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, UE is absolute gain and, and practices lots, although I, I know, of course, it isn't a, a complete loss to, to practice by, by any means. As I mentioned in the introduction, you recently finished your, your PhD. Congratulations with the wonderful title, Stuff and Space in the Home. Can you tell me where your interest in, in material possessions and UK housing design came from? I know this has been a, a long gestation Yes, so if you think about different, starting at U in 2005 to finishing in 2021, I've done an upside down career which has got its merits and I think it makes you value more research, if that makes any sense, that because I haven't done it in a straight line. Mm -hmm. um, so I, so part of that, I started in Field and Clegg, I was doing housing projects in the UK, I was seeing what type of housing uh, they were, you know, you were kind of designing and building in some of the projects I was working with Field and Clegg. Um, and then I was doing the Spanish housing, the kind of project for them uh, in, in Madrid. And uh, I started kind of realizing that you have all this kind of weird thing that you, you know, you sell houses by, by rooms, regardless what size it is and regardless mm -hmm. what you can put in it. And there is no sense of space or the fact that space is related to well-being or kind of uh, related to health. And um, 
And that, you know, in, in, nowhere in your, well, the fact that you don't have a space standards is a different type of conversation, mm -hmm. but um, you don't have a, um, a sense of what people, people need to live in their houses or to do the certain activities, but what people stores because of sentimental value, financial value, um, uh, or what people kind of is not ready to let go, and then they just chuck it into the garage, one shed, two sheds. So the fact that I did the housing for Phil and Clegg, the, the fact that I was working um, for housing in the UK and in Spain, and uh, my interest in terms of sustainability but with a well-being aspect, mm -hmm. led me to do a PhD on material possessions and stuff in the home, if that makes any sense, which is weird, because it's all about storage. And, but um, I, I was reflecting in this idea, what was my research journey and my interest? And I realized that sometimes research has got topical areas that they're kind of, um, it's like, a, you know, like the Instagram of research. Uh -huh. You have got topical areas of saying, you know, it's all about homelessness now in housing. This is, you know, your research, Lena, is very middle class. Or you have got, I don't know, um, science and engineering as the topic for research. There is topics that are, you know, dictated by our government, our uh, research bodies, our local authorities, all sorts of people that might fund research. But I also realize that it's important to have research for people. People is kind of, you know, it's really important. And I'm interested in, uh, in people's, uh, how certain things affect people in the case of the space, the home, possessions, um, uh, things that kind of, uh, I've been doing a little project lately about um, uh, architects' uh, perceptions during lockdown, how, you know, homeschooling and working from home has affected the way the house works. All those type of things that maybe before COVID were not really important have become even more important. So thinking about my research journey, I'm interested on the everyday, maybe things that they are not topical, they are not the Instagram of research, but I think they are, they've got a place in oh, research, think, a very important yeah, place. I think there's huge validity in that. Absolutely, those, uh, you know, an amalgamation of lots of personal stories and experiences, I think, is, is very, very, very valid. And I always say to my um, master's students or anyone doing a dissertation, you've got to do something that you're really enthusiastic about. And if you're not enthusiastic about it, I mean, I know you would be enthusiastic about so many issues, but I do say to the students, choose something that you care, you care about and you want to know the answer to, not because someone else has suggested to you that that, that might be interesting. And I thought about you last week, Elena, because I was uh, staying up in, in Scotland and um, the house we were staying in had this courtyard full of old buildings with falling in windows. And inside these buildings, there was so much stuff. And I wanted to know why it was there, what it meant to the owner and, and, and my sister, who is an architect. My sister and I were sort of creating this story of this individual that we'd never met um, to try and work out what those possessions might mean and also what might happen to them in, in, in the future. But apologies, that's a, that's a, huge, <laughs> that's a huge tangent. Um, how was your experience of, of drawing your PhD uh, together? Was that an enjoyable process? I'm sure it had its moments. So, uh, um, Professor Katie Williams was amazing to get me to this journey, and um, she clearly told me at the beginning of it, you are not a researcher, you are an architect, ah. and stop having good ideas. So, <laughs> it's kind of, a, it's like, kind of, you know, I started to have to stop, and I had to do this transition between being an architect and designer, and to become a researcher, and it was not an easy transition. I don't write very well. Um, yes, English is my second language, but... I do a lot of uh, spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, and of that I don't see. It's not my natural home. And also, um, this methodological approach is the of part of, you know, that method, the methods and the methodologies, and this uh, position in the research drove me nuts. It was oh. like kind of, I didn't know, you know, I come from, um, you know, I'm an architect, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, probably I spent too much time. So, um, funny enough, I end up uh, uh, being um, congratulated by the external examiners on kind of my thorough methodological approach. And it's just interesting because it was probably the thing I was very uh, 
you know, I was uh, fearing the most. It was the one that I ended up doing really well or positioning it really well because I was using multi methods, much very experimental. When you are, they are experimental and you try to validate them, it's complex and try to make sure that you did it okay. Um, so I think for me it's been this transition for, you know, being an architect to being able to do research and try to do it well. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to be a, a, a researcher, but I will do research after all this training, which is very different. So I, I don't know, with, with my current job, I can't do, <laughs> I've got a limited amount of time, but one of the things for sure is like, I'm not going to stop doing research just because I finished my PhD. So the PhD has become really important in terms of uh, understanding research, value, valuing research, um, and also understanding how long it takes to do very good pieces of research, and being much more understanding as well on how I approach my leadership within my department in order to be able to support it, but also being very pragmatic. Because if you think about it, I've done, I've done a PhD on my spare time. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I've got friends, I've run a department, I teach, and I do a lot of things I shouldn't do, but uh, I do, and you just fit them in. So it's just important as well to be aware of uh, being practical about what you can do. Uh, and, you know, and I think you can do it. And I think I've demonstrated as a role model. I think it's a good role model of saying, actually, you can do it if you want. But I had to be very ruthless with my time. Well, Elena, I mean, I just think that I really do say I think it's amazing. And I, I personally, I don't think all of our colleagues would agree but I think pragmatism has a has a role, real role to play. And I, I really welcome your honesty about the aspects of a PhD that you were fearful of. And you know, research journey can be very can be challenging. And I was just really fascinated by your saying, um, you know, I'm an architect, not a researcher. And I find myself now thinking, how long can I still say that I'm a planner for where most of my work is now in, in research, but actually, what do you think is the, is the difference? What would enable you to say that, that you are a researcher? Because it strikes me that you are a researcher, as well as being an architect and all of those other things, including being a mother and a friend. So, one of the, so I'll, I'll tell you, I, I think I'm going to answer it upside down. So, um, so, I didn't understand research, how to kind of, you know, articulate a good research question or how to, so that learning was, that's really important. Um, but the, the key one is like, it was really funny. It's like, I'm still an architect and I always will, will be an architect. And it was really funny because I did get corrections from my PhD. And one of them was uh, to acknowledge the important role that drawing took in the PhD. And that was completely, you know, I tried to kind of tighten everything up in terms of the piece of research. But one of the things I did is when I was trying to, you know, when I was trying to kind of articulate uh, uh, the, how the research linked with the questions, linked with the outputs, because it, the, I did a PhD, but I did by publication. Thank you, yes, and, uh, that. I had to diagram it. So I, did, I, I, kept, I kept creating these incredible <laughs> diagrams of how everything was fitting together, and I did it for everything, even when I was articulating methodologies, even when I was articulating the analysis of the methodologies, even when I was articulating conclusions. And it was really funny because you kind of, I didn't realize I was doing that, or that, you know, drawing was such an important part, but drawing allowed me to think, or allowed me to think through the research of how I was learning it. And it took a really important role, but it, I didn't. Uh, at the last minute, kind of the one of the external reviewers said, well, you need to acknowledge the importance of uh, drawing in your PhD. And um, it was really funny because we started in a, a massive uh, discussion if it, I use drawing as a method mm -hmm. or I use drawing as a tool mm -hmm. to articulate my thinking. And he said it was a method. And I said, no, I'm not doing a method. I'm doing a tool, which was really funny because... Uh, the other thing I realized is, as a PhD student, I'm not sure if many people would have been able to argue that back to a, to someone of a standing, if that makes any sense. That was one of the big things that happened in my Bible. I was able to stand up so, to certain kind of questioning yes, of the yes. thing and saying, no, I don't think you are right. I can, I can understand that it's really important in my PhD, but actually it's not a method tool. And I'm sure if I still kind of met a... Um, 
time chart, he will actually say that it's still a method, and I still will argue it's a tool. So there is also kind of very different perspective of what people understand. So I think I'm still an architect, and I use the architectural tools in my research, which I think is the benefit. Uh, but now, I think Katie Williams has made a research out of me. I was going to say, I think she absolutely, absolutely has. And yeah. yeah, good for you also for articulating, you know, the role of, of standing up for yourself in, in a viva, and actually that, that being a, an important part of the process, and if there's something that you really strongly believe in, that you should, you should be able to, to articulate that. Can I ask you what role you think research has in architectural practice more broadly? I think, as you know, I'm a fundamental, fundamental believer in research-informed practice and, and practice-informed research. Do you think that the architectural practice community embraces the need for ongoing research to support the development of practice? So that was one of my kind of, I think this, it, was, this, it was one of my observations when I was doing my research. So I think in planning that research informing practice is much more embedded and actually much more clear. Mm, However, yes. architecture has got, you could say, has got uh, areas which is kind of technical innovation. You could have this technical innovation or, you know, for example, taking house into zero carbon and being zero kind of things like that, which are very technical and require much more kind of um, uh, numeracy skills and maybe much more uh, science approach to the research. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of research as well that happens on the architecture space that is very theoretical, kind of and theoretical perspectives. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in, in my, when I'm in my head of department role, thinking about teaching and learning and different schools of architecture, you will find that there is certain schools of architecture, they are very practical, pragmatic, and they are kind of, you know, trying to kind of get a really good grounding. And there will be other schools that they are much more, as I call, fine art of architecture. They are amazing drawings, fantastic ideas, but try to kind of actually build them. And actually, there is no way in hell that will happen. And I have the feeling from my journey of discovering my research that the research is as polarized as that as well. There is a lot of theoretical underpinning of what they do. There is a lot of technical research, but what there is not much in the middle is research of the practice of an architect. Really and it was quite surprising that there was very little kind of, you know, uh, there is very little uh, elements of interviewing architects, how the practice of architecture, how to, and also a lot of little research on the design journey that practitioners do in order to develop design proposals, innovation in housing, offices, or any things like that. And that was really opening uh, because a lot of my literature review was not from architecture. I was drawing from planning, housing studies, um, I was drawing from uh, consumer practice, I was kind of uh, uh, sociology, um, philosophy. Mm -hmm but not from architecture itself. That's really and I think there are opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, but um, there is a perception in the architectural world that you know you have to be this kind of theoretical element or you're very practical. And that in this sphere in between is probably where my research has been positioned and what I think has got a real value. I think that middle space is really fascinating and I'm, I'm intrigued to hear that you think there isn't so much research on on the experience of, of being an architect and then that, that parallel interrelated inter area of, of the design journey as seen by architects. One of my particular uh, research interests is around the motivations of, of planners and their experience and practice and whether they, whether they match up and whether the practice narratives of disappointment are, are something we need to understand better. But again, another tangent that you give me a moment. I mean, it's no, it's, 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 yeah, it's similar, isn't it? It's, it's, it's tremendously relevant uh, and actually is where the interesting things that happen. And one of the things that happen in the research as well is I've ended up using very, um, you could, I don't know, original or novel methodologies in architecture. So I end up, uh, I kind of, one of the modules I did as part of the training was in art and design and I was looking about much more ethnographic approaches to to or much more explorative methodologies because I was trying to understand better what the freaking thing is the methodology about. And uh, I remember uh, 
going to art and design and Dr. Sean Roberts, uh, Shovers, um, uh, which is uh, photography and that's kind of an associate prof professor in photography that does, does a lot of ethnography work. He said, no, this is a visual ethnography. That's what, and he helped me position my, my research and I re realized the value of visual ethnographies and uh, phenolo phenomenological approaches, but not theoretical, much more grounded in research that they end up doing a lot, a lot on health mm. and medicine as alternative because they are so, you know, they, in kind of all the health and science, they use very trials, but that trial kind of almost like scientific um, mm. approach needs to be validated as well by those, all these, let's say, softer methodologies that bring the patient's perspective. Uh, and that's in a way uh, what they have in health is what we are missing in architecture. And for me, that was or oh, I think we do, I've got very strong opinions, and that is one of the things that I think is my contribution is. Absolutely. Eleni, you mentioned you're not going to stop researching. Fantastic. Uh, thumbs up to that. When you, you, you mentioned a couple of things you were interested in. Are there you know, particular projects or ideas you want to develop, you know, accepting that your time to devote to research is incredibly limited? So during lockdown, uh, so obviously I had to finish the, the PhD, but during the lockdown, I interviewed 23 um, architects and their uh, experiences during lockdown to try to, to understand from their perspective as architects how they will change the way they design housing for the future because kind of using their own experiences. If you think about it, any of us, we use our experiences when we make decision making, when we are making kind of an approach to something, so it was really important. And that is going to be published in a paper uh, that I've already... Well, it takes me a long while, but I don't think kind of it's written and um, it needs to be polished this summer and it's going to be published in buildings and cities, hopefully, um, for a special call in housing. And then there's the second one, I'm, I've done half of it, it's like uh, in, ar in architecture as well. For me, it's important my own research and my own interest, but the other thing is how do I advance the research uh, practices within my own department? So, uh, You've anticipated a... my next question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I have got now, I transformed the, the kind of um, the uh, DNA of my department in terms of having really fantastic set of early career researchers and having a, a, a almost transformed the culture of research. But um, also to try to, I still have got a third of my workforce that comes from practice and they don't do research and it's how you start um, uh, um, kind of telling them how to uh, how to uh, publish their kind of good practice either in research or in teaching and learning yeah. and that is sorry dissemination that's the word I was looking ah. for dissemination and impact Yes. Um, because some of them, they don't realize how important it is for their own careers, but also in terms of the life of the department and what is seen externally. Mm -hmm. And before I didn't have the critical mass to do it because there was not enough people to be able to do that. And the people I did have were very focused on, you know, uh, research also needs to bring money and uh, it was kind of very focused on the research centers. But um, now it's creating that community of making the transition of those people that might have come from practice, they have got a lot to offer, and how they kind of you help them to make that transition. And in a way, because of what I have done, not only because I finished my uh, DPhil, but also because, you know, I kind of do a lot of teaching and learning in terms of my principal fellowships and mentoring people doing senior fellowship in higher education, I have got a good sense of the things that people need to do. Um, and trying to make sure that they put all the pieces or all the stumbling blocks in place in order to kind of have an impact or a career or a profile. So, and I can be generous uh, in terms of kind of giving my time on things like that. So I have been doing, uh, there's a couple of my staff that are less confident about publications, but they did this amazing R3 uh, external learning environment under COVID, which is all designed for sustainability and for kind of giving the students uh, an outlet to get out of the rooms, uh, mm. build something and um, have a purpose. And I think recording that experience from a um, staff and student perspective is very, very important. So I have now done all the interviews uh, for the staff and then I'm using that the students being interviewed during the summer in order to record that project because that is one of the few 
life projects during the COVID environment that was, if not the only one in the UK, and it's very important to kind of be recorded from a research perspective oh, and a teaching fantastic. and learning inquiry. That yeah. sounds really, really fantastic. And uh, the idea that you're giving time to people joining the department from practice to help them into a research active life, whether that's you know, modest or becomes large scale, I think is really important. And, and I was interested in the fear narrative you mentioned earlier, you know, helping colleagues realise that actually research is, is fun and it doesn't have to be imbued with, with fear and, and anxiety and probably you'll really enjoy it. Yes, but I also think that, you know, in you or in my department, we are at a point where we are doing a step change towards a culture of research that is kind of acknowledged. Um, but we are also at a point that the institution is trying to change to that space. And it's very hard because you've got managers uh, that they have got a set, a mindset that is set of how we've done things for many years and they've been successful. But this is now requires a different type of leadership that values a much more holistic approach to how we do things and is tremendously important. I know it's just a, but also that means that we have to send the mindsets of the staff, of the um, uh, uh, managers and kind of the, those ones leaving. But the funny thing as well is, is acknowledge that what was might have been a good thing five, year, uh, five years ago go has now changed and there is different milestone which sometimes is very difficult for people to accept and that i think that's kind of how you balance so i i'm sure you know but we've tried to kind of then embed that culture in a series of activities like for example try to not send emails for a couple of weeks during the summer we are in this period now to make sure that people is able to have a breathing space to do their scholarship we run now three to four um, research retreats for the department. We also do that for the research centers. And now one of the things we reflected back, especially because we've got a lot of early career researchers, is kind of people is able to write journals and have them uh, published in really high impact journal papers. But that doesn't mean that the paper is a three or four star journal paper. So we have now run, will be the second time running that we run um, writing courses and we've identified people within the department to make that a step change. Um, and I think that's the only way that we have a kind of embed that culture, make that step change. But the problem I think is this not a step change that you can do from one day to the next. No, it's something it takes time. Well, I think your energy for all of that, as with everything else, is, is amazing. Elena, thank you very much. I'm going to finish our chat by asking you a, a few quick questions, if I, yep. if I may. Um, the first is your uh, favourite book or piece of literature that you'd like to share, whether that's architecture or, 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 or not. So I was thinking about that, um, because you gave me some prompts at the beginning, and uh, is that um, Dante, the Div La Divina Comedia, the Divine Comedy, and uh, giving you this kind of, uh, in my job, I go through many, 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 many levels of hell, purgatory, and sometimes <laughs> I've got glimpses of heaven. So I kind of, I was, um, that was someone who stuck to me, and sometimes when I'm doing my job or trying to keep my energy, uh, you remember, you know, those heads sticking out, you've got some of the drawings sticking out of the air, the kind of suffering, and that keeps me going. So that was one of the most impactful ones that actually, in a way, has become really important in terms of my job or what I like. And there's a second one, because I was kind of, I always break the rules. You're allowed. Uh, <laughs> one of the ones is an easy read, um, which helped me to identify, so, you know, people say, comes and says to me, oh, I've got too much work, and uh, I'm working 70 hours a week. I, as head of department, someone who is mother's kind of wife, friends, I do a PhD, I sit in boards, I do external things, I do my job, I teach, I do a lot of things. I do not work 70 hours a week. I'm ruthless with my time, uh, but I'm also aware when I, I waste my time and why I waste it, if that makes any sense. So I read a book called um, 168 Hours by Laura Vandermark, which is kind of the amount of time you've got in a week. And from time to time, every kind of two summers, I revisit it uh, to check on how much I waste, because I do waste a lot, because I want to, and um, making sure I do the things with the time frame I have got. 
Oh, that's such good advice. I'm, I don't know that one. I'm going to, to reach it out. And sometimes it's okay to waste time as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have to give permission. I yeah. give myself permission. Good. I'm very pleased to hear, hear, pleased to hear that there is at least some breathing space. I was going to ask you about your alternative career if you hadn't been an architect, but it sounds like you might have been an engineer. Was there anything else on the cards? Did you want to be a, you know, a chef or an astronaut along the way? No, I think the engineering I would have been the kind of second option, that the obvious one, if that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And is there a piece of advice that you would want to pass on in particular to you know, those early career set researchers or, or someone thinking about embarking on a, a research project? Be ready to change your research focus to follow the money if you want to do research. Very safe advice, Elena. Good, good one. Yeah, perhaps you need to tell that to me because I'm very keen to do a particular project that I'm not sure the money's ever going to be forthcoming for. So again, for another conversation. And finally, I was going to ask you when, where you'll visit when you're finally allowed, but I, I think you said you're off to Spain at the uh, weekend. Oh, I think I might have just lost Elena right at the end of our conversation. Well, I'm going to thank Elena very much for her time. I'm sorry that we've lost her. The connection seems to have gone, gone down. I know that she's off to Spain at the weekend, so to see family after a long period of absence like many other people living international lives have. So, Elena, thank you very much for your conversation. When we reconnect, I will obviously say that in person. But um, thanks for your time and I look forward to catching up with you again soon.